You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome. I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll find out how Africa can build the needed capacity to achieve the sustainable development goals. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market. You can also send your thoughts and your comments to my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. Now, how can African countries better prepare to take advantage of the opportunities presented by the Sustainable Development Goals? The Africa Capacity Building Foundation says limited human and institutional capacity will constitute a major obstacle for the successful implementation of the SDGs. Manon Nado, the Executive Secretary of the Foundation, joins me from Johannesburg to share more insight on this. Emmanuel, thank you for taking the time out to join us uh, this morning. Let's just get right into it. Uh, this study was carried out to you, uh, looking at 11 countries, and uh, Nigeria inclusive, and it identifies the capacities that African countries need in order to take advantage of the opportunities within the SDGs. Could you just walk us through, why, first of all, why uh, the foundation uh, considers this an exercise of this sort to be important at a time like this. Thank you very much for having me. Um, the African Capacity Building Foundation, as you know, has become a specialized uh, agency of the African Union responsible for ca capacity building in Africa. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we are given the mandate to really uh, examine how to support African countries to achieve their uh, development objectives, including the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we did a careful analysis of the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, and found out that the critical missing link or the challenge that made that uh, um, MDGs to not be fully accomplished or, or, or achieved satisfactorily in Africa was the capacity challenges. And when we talk about capacity challenges, we're not just talking about skills, of or expertise of, of people, but we're also talking about mindset that people have. We're also talking about institutions and organizations, uh, both in their structure and everything. So we, didn't, we don't want the SDGs to go the way that the MDGs went. And we see the SDGs as an opportunity for African countries to achieve their goals. So we thought that we have to start proactively to see whether or not African countries do have the necessary capacity you mentioned it, the human and institutional capacities to be able to really achieve the SDGs. This is really the reason why we undertook this groundbreaking study. Okay, but well, how would you describe your overall assessment right now in terms of how African countries, uh, f especially from a capacity point of view, how would you score uh, African countries at this point? Um, I would say over the years, uh, much progress has been made, uh, but I still see the glass as half full. In other words, there are critical technical skills that are required for economic transformation, for example, which is a, uh, one of the key elements of the SDGs, uh, as really seriously lacking in many countries, uh, whether it's in terms of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or even um, innovation and, uh, and technology. Uh, so that's one problem. Number two is, if you look at the capacity of the public sector that is supposed to be driving this agenda, there are still serious challenges. Based on our own analysis or the study that we conducted, those who work in government identified serious areas of, of capacity deficit in terms of human expertise, but in terms of basic things like uh, you know, doing um, planning, organizing, um, doing uh, monitoring and evaluation, procurement, you name it, different kinds of things that are supposed to be there that we see weaknesses in the government, governmental uh, apparatus that makes it difficult for government to play its role. Uh, we also see that even the, the regional and uh, continental coordinating organizations still have capacity deficits, whether they are institutional, organizational, or human. Uh, and so these are the sort of things that we have found out. I wish I could say, uh, give a better um, picture, uh, but unfortunately, um, the, I can say that overall, the overall finding of this study is uh, not completely encouraging. Imano, usually when for instance, ministries, departments, and agencies, when they're planning their uh, budgets for a new financial year, there's, I mean, I assume that there is always a budget for training, you know, constant training, uh, improving on uh, current skill sets. Are you saying that there aren't, these budgets don't exist anymore, or perhaps 
what is being has what is set aside in these budgets for training is simply not enough. It is both. In other words, if you look at the trend in the investment in capacity building across countries, instead of going up, it's going down, relatively speaking. So it's, it's not enough. Number two is we must make sure we know what problem we're trying to solve. This is why the ACBF, my organization, believes in, first of all, doing a capacity needs assessment, a diagnostic assessment to understand wh what the capacity challenges are, which helps to develop a strategy. And then before you start to, you know, start to implement the strategy and, and address the critical areas. So it's one thing to put a training uh, something in your, in your development plan or in your national budget. But are we training people in the right places? Are we using the, uh, the right trainers or the right organizations such as ACBF who, that understands these things for, I've been doing it for 28 years uh, to, to do the work? Or are we just basically uh, doing training for the sake of training? Uh, do we monitor and evaluate the impact of the training on those who are trained? But keep in mind that if the environment or the organizational setup is not conducive enough even when people are well trained, they're not going to be able to implement or to operate. Also, if they don't have the uh, equipment or the systems to work with, so this is not going to happen. This is why, as a capacity building organization, our approach is holistic. We don't just simply say, just do train a, a number of people. We look at the setup that is, that in which they will operate to ensure that they are able to ut utilize the expertise that they get uh, to support uh, the you know, policy making and implementation. Now, okay, before we go in, in depth into how the ACB, ACBF uh, rather uh, engages and ensures that capacity uh, is up to what it should be, let's also take a deeper look into some of the other uh, elements and findings from your reports. Now, you, the report identifies four sets of capacities that need strengthening. I think we've talked about one of them already, operational capacity uh, for organizations. You also talk about, I'm not sure if we've highlighted this already, change and transformative capacities. Uh, you talk about composite capacities, planning, facilitating, managing and financing, critical, technical and non-sector specific skills. Could you shed more light on this? Yes, this is uh, somewhat what I was alluding to in my previous statement, uh, that you have to look at these things holistically uh, countries that have been able to be implement their development plans and strategies are countries that have paid attention not just uh, uh, in terms of the number of people that they have, uh, you know, working in government or, or other organizations, but in terms of their readiness to uh, be able to embrace the changes that are happening and to be able to do their job properly. But also, they need to look into the issue of the organizational uh, capacity which is very, very important in terms of uh, providing incentives, in terms of uh, allowing people to really uh, um, you know, um, implement and, and do their job. Uh, but also uh, the, 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 the issue of uh, providing the right incentives. One of the challenges facing the African public sector is that they have not incentivized the, you know, the work environments uh, uh, enough to attract the best um, graduates from schools in Africa. Hardly you see the best, uh, uh, the best uh, performing students uh, work, wanting to go to work for government. And this must be changed. That's what the Asians did to make sure that working for government was something that was top priority. Uh, another thing is uh, the aspect of leadership, which is uh, the critical issue here. Um, because no matter what, uh, how much resources you have, whether the uh, organizations have equipment or not, and whether they are well organized, if the um, transformational leadership that is required at the top, not just at the, at the highest level of the presidency, but also at different levels. It could be ministers, it could be you know, captains of industry. If they don't provide the right kind of leadership and vision uh, you know, and provide the right coordinating mechanisms, I can assure you that uh, these are the things that will you know, prevent uh, the achievement of uh, development objectives, including the SDGs. When you talk about that sort of problem at, at that level, when you talk about the fact that for us to achieve the sustainable development goals, obviously we need good visionary uh, leadership at the highest levels. When, that is, when there is a deficit at that level, I'm just wondering, uh, it would appear that the best anyone can do, organizations, uh, uh, the ACBF, is advocacy. It's, you know, 
talking about you know the importance and the need for visionary good leadership uh, steering the ship of you know countries or the, the continent as a whole i mean isn't in terms of what organizations or anybody else can do isn't that limited you know if, if you're talking about uh, leadership at that level no it's not limited uh, per se uh, actually our uh, publications a flagship publication called the africa capacity report the current one is on leadership. You know, that is to how we can really tap into uh, visionary leadership to promote sustainable development in Africa. We, look at, we had a comprehensive look at you know, the, the leadership capacity existing on the continent, uh, the, uh, what constitutes a good leader and, 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 and ones that are not so good, uh, what are the best practices that we have seen, what are the leadership training programs and uh, all kinds of uh, capacity building programs that exist on the continent? Are they working? And uh, we have been really promoting this and sharing it with, uh, uh, with a whole lot of government. As a matter of fact, the forward for this publication was written by the president of Rwanda, who many people uh, uh, admit has really shown visionary leadership in promoting development in that continent. So we were able to now to begin to de develop the advocacy that is there, but also develop the support that is needed. I agree with you that this is entirely a demand-driven something. We cannot force any government to adhere to good leadership practices, but we can advocate and uh, nudge them in that direction. Now, still on the SDGs, I mean, the report also highlights that most African countries lack the political will to see national development strategies through to the end. I mean, that this is a, a disturbing uh, I mean, just looking at it on the face of it, I'm just wondering if we are not able to get past this very big uh, obstacle, then aren't we in danger of not achieving the sustainable development goals? You're absolutely correct. Uh, if, uh, if you look at the, the history of the continent, uh, you will see that yes, there have been many, many initiatives, whether it is the Lagos Plan of Action, the Abuja Treaty, uh, the uh, African peer review mechanism, the, uh, the poverty reduction strategies, uh, including NEPAD, and finally the Agenda 2063, which I think you know, really is the best thing that Africa has done, not because I was involved in the development, but because of how it is a comprehensive you know, um, assembly of all the initiatives that exist. Uh, so if you look at them, you would say to yourself, why do we move from one initiative to the other? And when we do an assessment of these initiatives, uh, often people will argue that they have not been satisfactorily implemented. Otherwise, the uh, economic and social conditions in the continent will be far better than they are today uh, than, than they were in the past. And youth unemployment and poverty would probably be a thing of the past. So uh, this, is, this is the reality of the continent. Implementation gap, lack of implementation. We have fantastic strategies and plans. But the problem is that they are not always fully implemented. And even when we say we're implementing it, we don't do the necessary assessment, the necessary evaluation to see whether the objectives have been achieved and to see how to take corrective measures to do that. If you uh, remember that African countries um, believed in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the erroneous advice that they should stop doing development planning. Um, all the countries today, whether you're talking about Korea, South Korea, you're talking about India, you're talking about China, all of them never stopped their five-year development plans. And the African countries believe that they could do without a plan. You know, remember what they say, if you fail to plan, then plan to fail. Uh, and so they now have come back to it. But some, but some countries will just simply make a plan and continue doing other things. And, and they never follow the plan. To, you know, to make sure that it is fully implemented. So what we're doing now is you know, encouraging them, building planning capacity to begin with, and, and helping implementation capacity to be built and to be established, and changing in the mindset, and helping in monitoring and evaluation. And one more important thing is the issue of data. Uh, if you, many statistics departments or bureaus are not fully well uh, equipped to be able to collect the necessary data uh, so that a lot of times we find countries planning without adequate data and information. If you're just joining us, Emmanuel Nadeze, Executive Secretary of the Africa Capacity Building Foundation, is our guest today on the show and we're discussing capacity imperatives for the SDGs. Emmanuel, thank you for your time so far. Uh, let's quickly wrap up the issue of data. Uh, could you shed more light on that in terms of uh, how 
how uh, bad the situation is and what the foundation is doing to help African countries do better when it comes to data? Yes, the question of data uh, is a very important question. Uh, but the issue of data is also a bit political because uh, sometimes the reluctance in strengthening data collection and data analysis capacity is just uh, to uh, something that concerns countries in because they might worry that this will be used for political purposes with opposition and, and others. And so there is a bit of a reluctance in making sure that adequate data is collected. Um, but data is uh, very important. The reason is because if you say that you're going to plan for a population uh, to maybe, uh, you know, to create uh, employment for the youth, but you have no idea how many young people that are unemployed, and you start estimating, how will you be able to ensure that you're achieving your, your, your results? How will you be able to measure uh, whether you have achieved your goals or not? Uh, it, it, again, it is, it is very important, not just for uh, economic planning, but for social planning, for issues related to maternal health and death, the issues related to infant mortality, issues related to poverty levels, uh, or even overall human welfare. So, uh, but the problem, like we have said, is many, many uh, statistics, uh, you know, departments in, in many countries do not have adequate capacity to be able to collect, analyze, and, uh, you know, prepare this, this, the data that is needed for planning and for monitoring and evaluation. Uh, this is an, a serious issue that must be uh, addressed. Uh, I think I will encourage African countries to see this as a positive thing and not something to be worried about. Uh, ACBF has been working with uh, many organizations, including the African Union um, and the African Development Bank, to really strengthen statistical um, capacity across countries and to harmonize the uh, collection of data at the you know, continental level uh, so we work with uh, the statistician general and uh, the statistics bureaus in many, very many countries uh, that require uh, you know, capacity development and, and I think we've achieved some success in a few countries at this point. Okay, let's talk of broader issues but still within of course uh, the African uh, development agenda and one of such uh, uh, that was highlighted in this report talks about budget support grants and you know what partners think on the one hand and what African governments uh, think on the other hand. You, I mean, this report highlights that there is a difference between what African development partners identify as priorities and what these partners are prepared to support. And this exposes the challenge of ownership of the development agenda by African countries. So obviously, issue of grants and how this money is spent. What can you tell us about that? Yes, this has been an issue uh, dogging African countries for quite a while. Uh, within the context of uh, uh, aid effectiveness and uh, you know the uh, official development assistance the issue here is that many african countries would like to invest in infrastructure for example they would like to promote structural transformation and industrialization uh, but often the partners say they want just simply to provide humanitarian assistance or that they want to uh, invest in health and education or social sector uh, not that those are not important, but uh, there's a difference between uh, making fundamental and strategic investments that will transform a country than just simply uh, using the term of somebody that say managing poverty rather than trying to eradicate it. Uh, so the, uh, uh, this is the, the issue here. Uh, there was a time when the support for, to African country was specifically targeted and, and prog uh, you know, project or program driven. But African countries say that we know what our priorities are, where the needs are. Rather than just simply target, focus on one thing you call that you think is the most important for you as a, as a partner, a development partner, we want you to provide budget support so that we can allocate the resources to the areas that we feel have, where there's the greatest need. So that matter is not completely resolved now. And this is where the, the dichotomy between what African countries want and uh, what the development partners are willing to support. Uh, but I think the most important thing that African countries have to be thinking about is how do you uh, begin to do what the president of Ghana is, uh, is, is preaching, I'm talking about Africa without aid. In other words, ending this excessive and perennial dependence on foreign assistance to even do the basic things and paying more attention to uh, domestic resource mobilization 
or using the support that you get from outside uh, to catalyze the uh, higher re revenue uh, mobilization or to invest in these kinds of strategic um, you know, uh, uh, investments that I talked about. Number one being infrastructure, especially power. Number two being uh, human capital, uh, human capital development. It's, uh, it's high time African governments begin to see the investment in human capital, uh, not just as a humanitarian issue, but as a real investment, like investment infrastructure. Because uh, if you don't see it that way, you will consider this to be a recurrent expenditure, not a capital expenditure. The human beings are the most important capital you can have because they are the ones, you know, development is meant for them, but they are the ones who are going to drive development. So human capital development is critical. Is that why we're seeing more, uh, and the report also highlights that, we're seeing more Africans and more African countries believing that the sustainable development goals can actually be better achieved if it's funded domestically compared to uh, outside forces, outside funding. I don't know, uh, at this point, are we at the point where this can actually become a reality? Oh, yes. It, it, no, if you look at this country by country, you may say that this is not possible because some countries, you know, clearly do not have enough resources to be able to uh, you know, address the critical challenges they face, especially those who are facing, you know, uh, terrorism and uh, instability and, and so, because, uh, you know, th there's huge investments in the security sector. But if you look at it globally as a continent, you'll see that the continent has billions and billions of dollars uh, invest put in, you know, outside of Africa in terms of, uh, you know, uh, reserves. And also there are other resources that are untapped, whether they're pension funds or other things like that that can be tapped into so that it's not necessarily to, to continue to, uh, but in any case, I don't know whether foreign, depending on foreign aid or foreign assistance can be a strategy that is sustainable. Because if you're, if you're uh, you know, the pest, who, he who pays the piper dictates the tune. And in any case, there's also uh, the fact that um, the person who is supporting you would you know, have influence or determine you know, uh, the direction you want to go. So but the, the point is that African countries have not succeeded enough in mobilizing resources within their countries and within the continent. And there, there, are, there are resources and, uh, you know, that they can actually mobilize. Uh, this will limit the dependence on outside, uh, uh, you know, outside support. Uh, and so, so for me, this is the direction. Countries must have a plan for you know, going beyond aid, as the president of Ghana has really uh, you know, um, preached to all of them. But would you say that a key determinant to that will be political will? Yes, of course. You know, political will is the other side of the, of this, the coin called leadership. Um, it's to say, because once the leader, overall leader, says the tone at the top that uh, something like corruption will be eradicated, or that they're going to begin to pay attention to transformation, structural transformation and industrialization, and to use their own resources, uh, you know, more judiciously and, and uh, mobilize them more effectively, uh, then you would see that the results will start happening. Because the organizations such as ours stand ready to accompany them in that kind of, uh, you know, direction. All right, Professor Naduze, we're going to have to leave you there. I must thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for being on today's edition of Beyond Markets. I've been speaking to Manon Nadozi, Executive Secretary of the Africa Capacity Building Foundation, talking about capacity building imperatives in achieving the sustainable development goals. That's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African time daily and have access to all previous episodes of the show on our website. That's cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets. And of course, you can follow my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awone. For myself and the team, it's bye for now.